Well, hello, AP Bio students. Um, Mrs. Shelton here. We are going to be talking about Chapter 41, Species Interactions, um, from your textbook. Um, so if you guys can have out your notes outline um, or a copy of it, that's going to be really helpful for you. And then also remember that I have um, posted this uh, presentation, this PowerPoint, um, on Schoology for you as well. Um, and today what we're going to be doing is actually just walking through um, the main ideas from chapter 41. I'm going to try to uh, make these screencasts a little bit shorter instead of going through the entire notes. Um, what I actually want to do is actually just go over the you must knows. Um, so from your test prep review series, um, so this is topic number 10 in that test prep review series. It's only three pages, um, page 277 to 280. Um, it's going to review some of those main concepts. Again, read this particular chapter too. It's really good, interesting reading. Um, gives you lots of good examples as well. But here are the five you must knows that I'm going to be addressing. So um, the first is that you need to know the difference between a fundamental niche and a realized niche. So that is going to be something that we are talking about in section one of the book, as well as the next you must know, the role of competitive exclusion in interspecific competition, also from section one. And then again from section one, some of these different symbiotic relationships. You definitely need to know parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism and understand just some of these um, positive negative relationships or positive positive relationships that exist in the community. Um, keystone species on a community structure. So we'll talk about keystone species, what those are, what community structure is, and different ways that you can display community structure. And then um, in section three, we will talk about the difference between primary versus secondary succession in a community. So um, those are the main things that we're going to talk about. Again, the rest of the content is still included in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to blaze through it just again to keep some of these screencasts a little bit shorter for you um, and hold your attention a little bit better. So first thing, um, before we address um, anything here, we do need to make sure that we're remembering our definition of a community. Your community is the interactions between different populations. Um, now here, I just think this is a pretty, pretty funny um, little dude here. So this carrier crab, um, he likes to camouflage himself by, you know, wearing the sea urchin as a hat. And so as he moves across the ocean floor, um, any of his um, predators are just going to see, oh, sea urchin, gosh, oh darn, where? I wish there was a carrier crab around for me to eat. All I see is this moving sea urchin. And then not only that, oh gosh, he sometimes actually wears a jelly on his head too in order to camouflage and hide himself. But these are relationships um, because actually these sea urchins or even these jellies, um, they get transported to new locations. That might be a benefit, it might not be a benefit to them, but we have to look at some of these interactions that exist in communities. So what we are addressing here is interspecific interactions. Or, and when they're interspecific, they're really interspecies interactions. So one species, how it interacts with another species in a particular community. Now, when we're talking about these types of interactions, um, they get summed up by that relationship between two. So if it is a negative, negative type of relationship, such as something like competition, all competitions, this battle for resources, it's harmful. There's an energy harm to both who end up competing. So it ends up being this negative, negative relationship. When we talk about something like exploitation relationships, one's going to benefit, the other one's going to be harmed. So those are plus negative relationships. And then we also have some positive interactions where it's a plus plus relationship or sometimes it's a plus zero relationship where the other's not harmed from this particular relationship. So those are some of the terms that we need to address, but we're going to be using those plus negative, plus plus, negative negative, plus zero to explain um, and define those relationships. So be familiar with those. Now, when we, again, what I said is anytime we're talking about competition, it's always going to be a negative, negative type of interaction that occurs. Now, in this particular idea, we have to also understand this concept of the competitive exclusion principle. Now, in the competitive exclusion principle, um, we also have to make sure that we understand the term niche. So basically what competitive exclusion says is that if two species are competing for the same resource, 
one's going to have a slight advantage over the other. And ultimately what that's going to do is push the other one out of that niche. That little advantage is going to end up being a huge advantage. And the other one is not going to be able to obtain as many resources in order to be able to coexist. So what competitive exclusion, exclusion really says is no two species will ever occupy the same niche in a community. When we talk about that niche, it's really those biotic and abiotic resources that get used by that particular species. If we take a look here, this is actually a really good example for you guys to understand when it comes to niches and also understanding competitive exclusion. So if I look down here, I've got two different barnacles. So I've got the, the brown barnacle and I've got the blue barnacle. Let's just call them that. Now, this brown barnacle actually has a fundamental niche of all of this space down here, if we actually take a look. So fundamental niche is all of the resources that they could potentially survive off of. However, in competition, here I now have the blue barnacle. And so what ends up happening here is that with this blue barnacle, this blue barnacle is actually better at resources right in this intertidal zone right in here but this brown barnacle actually then gets pushed up to these resources up here. So this becomes their realized niche. So in this competition, competitive exclusion says no two species can occupy the exact same niche due to this. And also with that too, you're going to understand this term niche. And then the difference between a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. Fundamental niche being all of the resources they could use. Realized being now because of competition. Um, because of competitive exclusion, what they're forced to now occupy and be limited to. Now, when we address another type of relationship, um, this is the most common type of relationship that we address in general, it's referred to as an exploitation relationship. These are plus minus interactions with one species. Obviously, predation is a plus minus relationship. A hawk that eats a snake, uh, it's kind of bad for the snake really good for the hawk. So that's a plus minus, herbivory. So when we look at some of these things, let's first of all, let's talk about predation. So what predation also ends up bringing out in organisms. So because of this plus minus interaction, um, this is also where we start seeing um, because of these interactions, we start seeing adaptations in different types of coloring, um, these morphological or physiological defenses. But when we actually see these morphological defenses in like cryptic coloration, um, cryptic coloration would be something like camouflage, where if we take a look at this picture here, in this cryptic coloration, camouflage, the whole purpose of this adaptation evolving, this coloration evolving, is to avoid predation. Um, so those who actually blend into their surroundings actually survive more, reproduce more. And so this is natural selection acting to bring about um, this cryptic coloration. Now, another type of physiological defense, there's a lot of chemical defenses um, that have evolved in order to avoid prey. And so with that too, a lot of prey ends up having warning colorations. This is what a possumatic coloration is is these warning colors, usually brightly colored um, insects and frogs. They taste bad. They've got a poison. Um, don't eat or lick brightly colored frogs. Mrs. Shelton's just rule of the day. Um, just don't do that. Um, but that's your opossumatic coloration. Now, if we have opossumatic coloration in a particular environment, well, some other species might actually start developing some of those colors um, and this is referred to that colors or shapes or things like that, that the other poisonous species has. And this is referred to as Batesian mimicry. So in this particular example, I don't like the example that they give here of these venom, the venomous snake, snake versus the non-venomous snake. Um, this would probably be a little bit better example for you to understand Batesian mimicry. Here is my eastern coral snake, this eastern coral snake um, with these brightly colored stripes. This one is highly venomous. Well, the king snake that is not venomous at all, actually evolved to now have these colored stripes too. Because this being very venomous and poisonous to predators, well, predators started leaving any striped king snakes alone too. And so there's just, again, natural selection um, 
affecting these as well, and them having the adaptation of these, um, this Batesian mimicry example. But these are all colorations that we end up seeing as a result of predation and natural selection. Now, another type of exploitation is herbivory. Um, so when we talk about herbivory, this is going to be that action of some type of primary consumer eating the producer. Um, so when we think about herbivory, we're not often thinking, oh, the poor, you know, the poor kelp here and this poor vegetation being eaten by Mr. Mean Old Manatee here. Um, but primary consumers, so are herbivor the herbivores, and they are preying on the plant life. Um, so that is a plus minus relationship. The plants are not actually growing, so Mr. Manatee can be fed. It just happens. That's another plus minus relationship here. Now, parasitism is another type of exploitation. And so in parasitism, um, what ends up happening here, and it's a plus minus relationship, the parasite needs a host. And so that host, though, is providing energy to the parasite. Um, usually parasites don't want to kill their host um, because that would end up being um, an over-exploitation from that parasite, but they still suck a lot of energy away from that particular host. So it ends up being this plus minus interaction. Um, something that um, like here, here's actually wasp laying its larva on this, this worm that's here. And so these larva are actually gonna be using the worm as an energy source um, while it grows. Um, now something that would be a parasite to us, mosquitoes are actually a classic example of a type of parasite for us. We don't think of it because it's not necessarily going to kill us in one or two bites. But if you now had thousands of mosquitoes feeding off of you, then that's a lot of energy that you would end up losing. So that would be some type of parasite um, or parasitic relationship. Okay, so those are all the negative interactions that end up happening. So let's go to the happy interactions that end up happening. So these positive interactions, um, mutualism and commensalism are the two that we need to make sure that we are understanding. In mutualism, so this particular relationship, this is a win-win relationship where both end up benefiting from this relationship. So you guys have all seen Finding Nemo, clownfish in anatomy. Um, those benefit greatly with each other. But here's another example of these acacia tree and these ants. They both actually need each other in order to survive. This ends up being this win-win situation for the acacia tree um, and then also the ants as well. Now, we can also have a commensalate relationship. Like barnacles on a whale would be a commensalate relationship. The barnacles do not hurt the whale whatsoever. They're not taking any energy from the whale, but they're getting a nice home from that particular whale as well. Here, we're actually seeing these cattle egret um, on this buffalo. Um, in this particular instance, um, this sometimes is a commensalate relationship where the buffalo is not benefiting, but it's also not getting harmed by these cattle egret. But actually, sometimes, depending on how many parasites might be on this cattle buffalo, these egrets might actually be eating them. And so then it turns into a mutualistic relationship. So those are some relationships that you guys should know and definitely understand those terms um, as far as when they are a plus plus, a negative negative, um, a plus minus type of relationship is what you should know. Now, Another concept to make sure that we are aware of is we are understanding how to describe um, community structures. And in community structures, um, some of the things that we look at is we try to look at species richness, the species diversity, um, but we really want to address and make sure that we're comfortable with this term trophic structure. When I say trophic structure, that trophic structure is that feeding relationship between organisms in the community. And really the trophic structure, um, in order to describe a trophic structure, we have to understand that food chain. So those trophic levels from producers up to our top carnivores. No community can survive without producers. Remember, I mean, that photosynthetic process is essential in order to be able to convert inorganic ingredients into stored um, carbohydrates and stored um, molecules for consumers. Now, in a food chain, some terms that you should be familiar with. So here's just two different food chains here. And so I've got my primary producers. I have plants, and then I've got a primary consumer. Um, so this is my herbivore that's gonna be eating off of the primary producer. Then I'm gonna have my secondary consumer. So these are carnivores. 
then I'm going to have a tertiary consumer, and then I potentially have a quaternary consumer. It really depends on this particular ecosystem if it can actually support five different levels. This usually, though, is the maximum number of trophic levels any particular community can have because there is a rule um, that actually says the most energy that this that each level can pass up to the next level is 10%. Can't pass any more than that because again, these producers aren't producing to be able to support all of these guys up here. They've got to use their energy for their own growth, for their own reproduction, for their own metabolic processes. And so, really, in order for this level to survive, only about 10% of the energy from this level can actually get passed up to the next level. And the energy from this level, only about 10% can get passed up to here. And only about 10% of the energy in this level can get passed up to here. And actually, we start seeing, if you count the biomass, we actually start seeing the biomass of each level in great amounts at the lower trophic levels and biomass very, very low in these upper levels as a result of that 10% rule of being able to move energy up those trophic levels. Now you also, probably your freshman year biology, you did a pyramid showing all of these trophic levels, but just make sure you're understanding your, your primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and then your quaternary consumers is what we should make sure that we are recognizing in these ecosystems. Now, food chains, great for just kind of understanding just a straight line event. But really, we should understand that in ecosystems, it really is a food web. Um, food webs, it's this complete interaction between all of the different organisms and um, the energy transfer through all of the organisms in an ecosystem. Now, in understanding this community dynamics, we need to understand there are some species that have a huge, huge impact on that community structure. Now, Sometimes it's the one that's most abundant, like the dominant species, but the one that we have to know is we need to know what the keystone species is. And that keystone species may not be the highest in number, but it is the one that ends up being kind of the ultimate controller of that community when they are removed. And unfortunately, we don't often recognize how important a keystone species is until it's removed from the environment. Like, take a look here at sea otters. Well, sea otters actually got overhunted on the Pacific, on the Pacific coast um, for their pelts and for their fur. And so when they were overhunted and removed from the area, well, it ended up now pretty much destroying the habitat in that area because what sea otters eat and consume is they eat sea urchin. And so that is the main thing that they'll dive down, they'll pick up sea urchin and they will eat the sea urchin. Well, now when you don't have enough sea otters, well, the sea urchin population now explodes out of control. Well, sea urchins, they feed off of kelp. And so now when you remove the kelp, now you don't have as much oxygen production, your primary productivity decreases. And so now this particular habitat ends up not surviving. Now, why it's called a keystone species is because if we understand arch architecture, um, in order for arches to be built out of stone, the keystone is this main stone at the top that is actually holding the entire structure together. Um, so it's a very symbolic name to call it a keystone species. Um, I posted an article on Schoology for you guys to read. Um, read about what has happened since wolves have been reintroduced into the Yellowstone habitat. Um, wolves are a keystone species and just every influence that now that wolves are back, how many other species have actually come back um, to the Yellowstone area. So including fish, um, lots of bird population, et cetera. Um, so make sure you read that article to understand that significance of keystone species. Now, our very last concept that we need to be addressing is we need to address um, our succession. So when we talk about ecological succession, what we're addressing here is after disturbances. Um, and after disturbances, and disturbances are sometimes good. There's a lot of ecosystems that actually something like this, like fire, is an important part of an ecosystem structure. Um, there's a lot of energy that gets contained in the plant life and the plant life that dies. Well, we need a lot of those nutrients to be returned back to the soil and that energy to be released. And actually, sometimes fire is necessary for that to occur. Now, with this, um, this is an example of a secondary succession. So here, fire is clearing out a lot of the plant life that is in this particular area. 
But with this, what we're going to see is after this fire, we get a lot of new growth and a lot of new vegetation. And then we're going to get some young trees that are actually coming in here as well. And then after about 20 years, we're going to have this full forest reestablished again. So this is that succession this process of moving from the beginning to the end. Now, this is considered secondary succession because after a fire, the topsoil, the nutrient rich portion of the soil that can support plant life is still intact. And so that's why a secondary succession, we are going to have changes and ultimately that, that main ecosystem established um, fairly, fairly quickly, as opposed to something like primary succession. And in primary succession, we don't have topsoil established yet. So here's actually an example of a secondary succession we have glaciers receding in this particular area. And as those glaciers recede, there's no topsoil yet. So what we get is a lot of mosses and lichen and things like this that come in in order to now start decomposing, breaking down the rocks, establishing soil. We get some smaller shrubs that come in, then we get some trees, and then we get some bigger trees that end up coming in. Um, and you can see actually over this course of time, um, this is a long period of time for this primary succession to happen. Another example of primary succession would happen after like a volcanic eruption. Um, so that lava then has to be, topsoil has to be established. So that would be a primary succession. So make sure you're understanding that ecological succession and actually what ends up really determining what some of these large organisms at the end stages are going to be, is actually what comes in at the very beginning. Um, and then just some of the animals that end up coming in once we have producers well established as what's going to be happening. So as far as chapter 41, um, again, let's go back to the you must knows um, and make sure that we are addressing. So here, um, I know we're going fast. Close your eyes if you are subject.